Tonight's panel is about women and science. Um, I'll let the panelists themselves uh, get into the subject. I will introduce them briefly. Uh, starting from my far left is Jessica Transick, who is the Atlantic Richfield Career Development Assistant Professor of Energy Studies um, in Engineering Systems Division at MIT, and is also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Some odd echo here. Uh, um, in Santa Fe. She received her BS in Material Science and Engineering from Cornell and her PhD in Material Science from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Um, before she arrived here, she spent several years at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, I guess as a um, non-external professor, but an internal, uh, um, and at Columbia University as an Earth Institute Fellowship Fellow where her research focused on energy systems modeling, uh, and her research group here studies the dynamic costs and environmental impacts of energy technologies um, and how they inform technology design and policy. Uh, next to Jessica is Paris Sabetti, who is an associate professor at the Center for Systems Biology at Harvard um, in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, and in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, she's also a senior associate member of the Broad Institute, located across the street. Uh, um, she is a computational geneticist with expertise studying genetic diversity, developing algorithms to detect genetic signatures of natural selection, um, and carrying out genetic association studies. Uh, she had, went to MIT as an undergrad, um, and also was at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and got her medical degree from Harvard uh, her medical school is a Soros Fellow. If you're interested in learning more about Pardis, there's an excellent um, profile of her in Smithsonian Magazine from a couple years ago uh, that I wrote. Um, <laughs> uh, Rosalind Williams, uh, who is next to me, is the um, Byrne Gibner Professor of History of Science and Technology at MIT. Uh, she went to Wellesley and then also uh, got a BA from Harvard um, and an MA from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, so despite going out to California, came back to Boston, which I'm sure this winter she's regretting. Um, uh, and also got a PhD in history from UMass Amherst. Her first three books, um, Dream Worlds, Notes from the Underground, and Retooling, all examine the implications for human life, both individual and collective, of living in a predominantly self-constructed world. Her most recent book, The Triumph of Human Empire, surveys the overarching historical events event of our time, the rise and triumph of human empire defined by the dominance of human presence on the planet. Um, it is my uh, utmost honor to welcome the three of these speakers here. Um, one of the thrills of getting to do this job is that I can invite people that I want to hear from and then hear from them. Uh, so without further ado, good there. there. Thank you. Doesn't sound like it to me, so. Right. Oh, okay, so thank, thank you for coming. And so this is the, uh, the order of business. Uh, I will introduce, well, we'll start with Jessica, and then Pardis, they'll both describe their background in a less formal way than Seth did. Uh, it, it will be a sort of short autobiography of interests and education, like why are they here? You know, how'd they get here? What, what's, what's going on? So after that uh, self-introduction, then I'll introduce myself a little bit and also refer to some of the, the history of women in science at MIT now 20 years ago, which is startling to, to realize. But I, I want to very briefly give some context for what we're talking about uh, when we talk about women in science here. Um, then we will have a conversation among ourselves. This is one of these kind of talk show conversations. We're talking to each other, but there's an audience. Anyway, mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes. And then around six-ish, uh, we'll open up for questions from you all. And when you ask questions, please come down to the mics so it can be recorded for the, the broadcast or the program, the video, whatever, uh, but also so I can see you. It's kind of, there's glare here. So uh, if you want to ask a question, just stand up and, and get in line, please. OK, so we will kick things off. Jessica? Okay. Thanks so much. And um, we all great to see 
all of you here. I um, look forward to this conversation. So I thought I'd start, you know, I was sort of thinking, how did I get to this point? And it's not always clear to me that there um, was like a grand plan. But um, I think the story starts in high school where I, um, where I actually had a lot of interests. Uh, my favorite, favorite topics were mathematics, English, and fine arts. And um, you know, so I had some trouble deciding what to major in. Um, I, you know, I think my, my interest kind of can be boiled down to, still today, uh, uncovering patterns in the human built and natural world uh, that can be explained with equations and with words. Um, and then also using design to try to make the world a better place. So that was sort of broadly what I was interested in. I decided to study material science as an undergrad. And um, you know, what drew me to material science is that uh, it, it's, it's a field that's really focusing on understanding the basic elements that we have here on Earth, the elements of the periodic table, how they can be combined into useful materials, how they are combined into natural materials, um, and then thinking of new ways to combine these elements to, to make new technologies and, and novel uh, materials with new functionalities. Uh, so I studied material science as an undergrad and then went on to do my PhD also in material science where I used advanced microscopy techniques to study the structure of uh, natural polymers that have very high strength and are produced in nature uh, through energy efficient means. So I studied spider silk and silkworm silk and a number of other materials. Um, and after finishing my PhD, I, I really felt the need to focus on that second interest that I mentioned, which was you know, design and trying to contribute to making the world a better place. And specifically, I wanted to focus on the big picture and some you know, of the global problems that are related to engineering and technology. And I went to work for the UN in Geneva for some time. And that's where my research shifted to a focus on energy technologies and, and understanding how we can use clean energy sources that we have here on Earth to provide useful forms of energy for transportation and electricity. Um, a big part of that is thinking about how we can use materials and elements that we have on Earth to convert uh, forms of energy, you know, energy in the sun, for example, to, to electricity and other um, useful forms. Uh, so then I began really the research that I do now, which focuses on the big picture and on the small picture at the same time. I'm interested in evaluating technologies for electricity, for transportation, um, and looking at how we can set design targets for technologies that can help accelerate the, their development in the lab. So for example, uh, one of the projects I'm really excited about right now is one where we're looking at how people drive around the US, the energy that they use to get from point A to point B. And we're using that to try to set energy density targets for batteries that are being developed in laboratories around the world. So that's, that's one project. Um, on another topic, I look at evaluating environmental impacts and how much, by how much we need to cut down emissions of greenhouse gases from various energy technologies, looking at how um, you know, to compare methane emissions to carbon dioxide emissions and setting targets for emissions per unit energy of a variety of energy technologies that we use today. And my group um, is rather diverse. I have a group of you know, men and women coming from a variety of fields, inclu including physics, um, environmental engineering, industrial engineering, um, mathematics, um, as well as economics. And um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I, I'm really looking forward to talking about this topic, because I think I've noticed firsthand how diversity in the research group, you know, gender diversity, other forms of diversity, really help to uh, kind of improve our, our problem solving and help us generate you know, really interesting and, and, and um, I think you know, hopefully helpful, useful research results. Uh, so I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm Pardis Sabetti. I am, uh, so Jessica and I know each other for a very long time. We were at Oxford together the same year. So this was really fun to get a chance to do this together. And I was so thrilled when she came to MIT and was a professor. So she's one of my favorite people in the whole world. So it was Roz, actually. And I was an undergraduate. Um, and she took care of me when I was an undergraduate here. So it's a long history. 
Um, but I'll, I'll take you through that trajectory a little bit. So um, I was uh, born in Iran, uh, in Tehran, Iran, uh, just before the Iranian Revolution. Um, I have a, with my sister and my parents and then my kind of larger collective family, we left right before the kind of uh, everything escalated and traveled around for a long time, uh, but then finally settled in, in Florida, uh, where I grew up. So I um, grew up a very, I mean, I, I saw I'm, a, I'm a technically a child of a revolution, but I talk about that in a big way of that's not something that is in any way something you overcome, because what you overcome is parents who don't love you or uh, experiences that are sort of, or, or um, you know, other kinds of uh, experiences sort of in your microcosm. But um, when you have some political thing that your family's overcome, it's actually only motivating. Um, and I had an amazing mother and father who were always incredibly encouraging to my sister and I, and who made us not even realize that we were in some sort of a terrible situation. And, uh, um, and as a result of it, I grew up in a household with my grandparents and my uh, uncles and aunts, and I shared a room with my grandmother and my aunt and my sister and uh, my cousin at times. And so it's a kind of an idyllic life, actually, because as a child, you like that. I don't know, kids always sleep by themselves these days. Um, anyway, so I, and I grew up in Orlando, Florida, for the most part, and um, came to uh, MIT as an undergraduate. Um, for whatever reason, I was in a lot of math advanced classes and sort of in a woman context. The, my year was one of those years where I've, at times I was the only girl in my, most of my classes. Um, then I was four of like 35, uh, four girls of a class of 35. And then when I went to MIT, it was kind of that year where it dipped and there was like 20% women. So I've kind of always been in an environment where there are fewer women. Um, uh, but I never really experienced anything. Uh, uh, it was still, I thought, an idyllic experience um, in, in every way. I, I love. I love math, I love science, I loved MIT. It was an amazing place to be a student. Um, I saw the 270 competition, or now 2700, or 270 competition in, when I was in seventh grade and was like, that's where I'm going to school. Um, and, uh, and then went to Oxford with, um, so, um, with Jessica, and uh, it was interesting. It's an interesting place to do research. I lo love it, uh, loved it as an experience. Um, but it was a place where I started to see my first sort of challenges and thinking about what I was gonna do in my life. Um, the, uh, from there, I uh, went to medical school, and, um, and then while I was at Oxford, I ended up doing a PhD, and so now I'm a, I have an MD and a PhD, or it's a, called a DPhil, and do my research um, in sort of the interface of genetics um, and infectious disease. And so uh, a lot of the stuff that Seth was talking about is my core. It's the work where I um, develop algorithms to mine uh, genomic data. but um, the, the kind of work that I've been doing more uh, sort of in a bigger way lately is work in infectious diseases, including Ebola and Lassa fever. And, and one of the big things our project, uh, our group worked on is releasing the sequences from the Ebola genomes uh, when they became, uh, when the outbreak first began. And we just actually just released another 96 and published a paper, in, um, a commentary saying we need to make outbreak data um, open access. Uh, in any case, that's a little bit of background. Um, and I've been a f on faculty at Harvard now for about seven years. Um, as far as, I mean, so I'm really ex excited about the conversation. That's just a little bit of background about myself. Kinds of other things that I didn't mention along the way is that all along the way, uh, folks like Roz and others have been these amazing mentors for me. So I didn't go into the whole thing that we, we did together, which was develop actually a diversity program. The freshman leadership program was an undergraduate. Um, uh, were ways of really kind of inspiring young, uh, young students to take leadership, to take ownership of their communities. Um, but I've had these amazing experiences along the way of great mentors, men and women who have mentored me. Eric Lander being another one. I've been his mentee for 21 years now. Um, and uh, obviously that's an incredibly important thing. And then great students as well. And I have a very diverse group of individuals from different backgrounds, a, a broad mix of men and women. Um, and, uh, and a broad mix of inner disciplines that they come from as well. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about me, but we'll kind of come back to that okay. one too. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a lot of questions already. <laughs> I'm sure you do too. Uh, I will say very, about myself very briefly that uh, uh, my own interests, well, my family background is, is very varied, uh, but the educated side of the family as opposed to the non-educated, they were all in 
uh, science, engineering especially. My mother taught math in the community college for years. Um, so it, for me, it was more like, why are you interested in history and literature, not in these other topics? So mm -hmm. although I, I, I don't want to, I'm overstating it, because it was a very encouraging family, whatever you're interested in. But I, I felt on this fault line between my own interests in history and literature and the family doing engineering and science, especially engineering and math. So, so going into history of technology seemed like a way to have the best of all worlds, and I still feel that way. So I want to show you, though, a little of the larger historical context for what we're talking about. Because it, it struck me, by the way, th this is a slide that I got from Nancy Hopkins, uh, who was kind of the leader of the pack back in the 1990s when women in science were speaking up about their um, uh, systemic discrimination uh, in the School of Science here. So she gave, Nancy gave a talk in 2011 at the 150th anniversary of MIT on this topic. There was a whole um, uh, special meeting on women in science. And she had a bunch of slides, and these are her slides, that, that, or I'll show you some of them. But this is one of my favorite slides, because I use it when I, when I teach history, or often in other institutions, I say, you want to know what history looks like? That's history. That's change. Just look at it. Uh, so this is, I, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but anyway, going back to 1901, we don't quite go back to the beginning at MIT, but just showing the flatness, and then whoops, all of a sudden things start happening. And they start happening around here in the 1960s. Well, I graduated in 1966. I married an MIT cl class of 65. So my life is this upward curve, all right? And uh, your lives, now when did you get your PhDs? Um, well, yeah, two, like 2003, I think, is where I got mine. But early 2000s. Okay. Yeah. okay, so, so you're, you know, you're on this end of, yeah, of the graph. Mm -hmm. um, but most of this, then, you're coming into science, at least with your PhD, mm -hmm. you're also on a sort of rising curve. But it's, it's a second, second wave. Um, so what I'd like to do is show you more clearly the faculty numbers. OK, so this is a little finer grain. And you see, you've got a blip around 1970. I would call that the, the Sheila Woodnall blip. But anyway. Uh, but then in 1995, 1996, then you have this really sharp upward curve. Now, Nancy said, well, that's the Bergenau curve. It, it was the deans of the School of Science who were the first that the faculty women went to with their complaints. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was the dean, really, that, who went then to Chuck Best to say, what do I do? Is it, or not what do I do, but I'm informing you about these complaints. I'm informing you that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to respond to them. And Chuck Vest said, uh, "Of course." Mm -hmm. And okay, but this is where things start. And then the second phase is when Mark Kastner becomes dean of science. So, so these are these are individual stories. It's not just institutional workings. Okay, but the individuals, of course, right, I'm just going to go through these who really matter in the story. These are the 16 women who uh, ended up in Bob Bergenau's office in 1994. Uh, now, and this story is very, it's worth mentioning how that happened. Nancy Hopkins had a complaint about space primarily, but also committee assignments and teaching assignments. But space was a big deal. So, so Nan this is Nancy, bottom, bottom right there. So, this is communications form. So the communication she chose was to write a letter to the dean. But she asked somebody else to read over the letter, another woman in science. I forget which one it was. But she asked, just read it over. Is this OK? Am I being too shrill? You know. Um, and the other faculty members said, not only is it a good letter, I want to sign it too. And that started Nancy going around to the other women in the School of Science at that time. And, and then that led to a meeting in the dean's office where they all sat around a table, all 16 of them, plus the dean. And, and he has said 
that he knew many of them were unhappy, he knew things were going on, but it was the collective narrative of 16 people telling the same story in the sense of these are the problems I have, this is how I react, this is how I feel about it. Then he said you couldn't dismiss it as that individual being a crank or that individual. Yeah. It was the collective weight of the storytelling. So I just, I just, I think this is really interesting for how history works. So I'm going to leave these people up on the on the screen so we can all admire them while we're um, discussing about where things went from here. And I mean, it went to a report and then another report and then a report that got published in 1999 publicly, uh, which led to a lot of publicity for MIT. So, so. Um, uh, Bergeron's account of all this, which was recently published in the MIT faculty newsletter in the form of an obituary for Chuck Vest. The, he ends this narration about this whole episode by saying, academia has not been the same since. Now, he doesn't say we solved the problem. I, I know he chose his words carefully, but academia has not been the same since. So my, I, I'd like to hear from both of you, just is this any history that you ever heard or got, or was there any sense when you were coming on the scene with your PhD that you were on some kind of a, um, in a moment where women in science were on the verge of you know, a new life, a better life? Um, did, did anybody ever talk to you about this? Did any of your mentors describe it? or? I mean, I guess I can, uh, you know, I had one mentor at Cornell, M Mary Sansaloni, who uh, was really actually, until I got to MIT, one of the few um, senior um, colleagues I had that was a woman. Um, so it w really wasn't until, so from undergrad, you know, until MIT, I worked pretty much only with, with men, um, both below and above me. Um, and, you know, because that was who was, was around at the various places I was. Um, and then arriving at MIT, it was really interesting because, um, you know, it was the first time that I was interacting with these senior um, female professors, and, and that, was, that was really great. Um, but, yeah, so, I, you know, I had, I had a mentor in college, Mary Sansaloni, and, and she, I think, um, did talk about this transformation. Um, you know, like Pardis, I really didn't have any negative gender-related experiences kind of going through school as an undergrad, as, as a doctoral student. Um, I mean, oftentimes I was the only woman in the room, but I didn't necessarily, and I think this has to do with how I was brought up and my parents and family and so forth, I didn't necessarily notice it or focus on it. Um, I mean, I think where you start to notice it more is where the sort of basis uh, on which you're being evaluated, the way in which you're being evaluated is less, um, you know, less quantitative, less clear, and a little bit more subjective, then, you know, then you, you start to be more conscious of it. Um, but it's, yeah, so I mean, I, I was certainly aware of this transformation that was taking place, and it has been great to see the changes, and also the changes in um, you know, the undergrad, graduate population and uh, student population in engineering, um, you know, and the growth of, of, um, of uh, in the number of female mentors that I, that I, that I now have. Pradeep? Um, yeah, so first I guess I would like to just take a moment and talk about the report. Um, and I, I was very well aware of that report when it came out. I had graduated at that point, but I had obviously um, was kind of, uh, as an alumni, you know, interested in what, what was happening. And I, I mean, I just love that report. It's this interesting thing, actually, that a lot of places think that by admitting you have a problem, you have a problem, right? Mm. And uh, yeah. it's actually the opposite in my mind, right? That uh, the fact that MIT released this report is what makes it probably the best place on earth mm. to be a faculty. And I think that's really important to note because somehow they, some people try to give them a lot of flack for that of, oh, like MIT is a place where they don't treat women well. And, like, I mean, they dug into their own problem. They publicly released it. And I tell you, I've been at other universities. I, I'm at another university. Their problems aren't any less because they don't talk about them. And, um, and in fact, I think they're more. So I mean, t to me, that, that report was amazing. And it was, and it was just so nice. I mean, I think that's also one of the reasons I, 
I love being a scientist. It's just like, you know, there is a problem. Now let's get some metrics on it, right? And let's really actually understand that. I think that's the only way you, transparency and, and metrics are the way we move forward. Yeah. So I, I, I love that report. I love what Nancy did. I admire her, admire her greatly. It takes a lot of, you know, it's a bold move. It's, it's to, be, to particularly be the first person to kind of talk about these issues yeah. and not seem like you're just somebody who's just complaining, right? Yeah. To say, how do I artic articulate this in a way that's productive and it moves the field yeah. forward? Yeah. And as far as who talked to me about it, I mean, I don't, I think it was, I, honestly, I think I was reading it myself and personally interested, but it uh, wasn't that we had kind of discussions about it in that context, but you just sort of are always talking about it in some way. Yeah. I mean, like I said, my, my greatest mentor is Eric Lander. He's a man, but um, I, man or woman, it's not, that's not what I, I focus on. It's what the strength of their character. And he himself has always been an incredible supporter mm -hmm. of women. A lot of his top management are women, and he is just an extraordinary sort of understander of the importance of diversity and um, and a real, you know, I've been very lucky. I think I think one of the things you always realize, and I think Bill Clinton once said, every every person who's successful has one person who believes in them, and he was talking about his mother in that context. And I think in your professional career as well, I do a lot of talks about mentorship and about being a good mentee and about finding a good mentor, and both are important. Um, but within that context, that every person who's successful has somebody who is sort of looking out for them as well. Um, and uh, anyway, so that within that context and. We can kind of go further. I think Jessica made a lot of really good comments about Yeah, I'd like to get back. Cause, I mean, one just question is whether you think choosing your mentor by gender is, you know, should that matter? Is that? I mean, I tend to agree with parties that, you know, it really doesn't matter. I've had, I've had wonderful male mentors. So at, at, in undergrad, uh, Stephen Sass was my main mentor, and he really kind of, set me on this path of research, got me into, you know, into the lab kind of my first year there. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think men as, as well as women, um, you know, they, they've sort of played an equally important role as, as a mentor. And, and, and many, you know, sort of thoughtful individuals, whether they're men or women, understand these issues and kind of see what's happening in this transformation that's happening in the sciences and engineering and bringing more females in. Yeah, go ahead. I don't have to. I don't. You can talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're yeah. I, I mean, I would, and I would say that obviously, I think there's a very important that there are women, right? Whether yeah. your spe your specific mentor is is a, is a very different, you know, per and personal experience, and it's somebody who you work well with, and it it shouldn't be defined by um, gender or ethnicity or any of that. It's sort of someone who speaks to you, right? So I would say the way you choose your mentor is someone who you are inspired by, who you think is brilliant, who you trust, who you will kind of be guided by, and who has the integrity for, uh, that's sort of worthy of your loyalty. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I have often say I made my career by trying to please my mentor. Uh, you know, in science, you this first author and last author paper, so it works well that way. Um, and it's done very well by me. Um, and I think that that's, that's a relationship each person should have. Obviously, for some people, they really do gravitate and want it to be a woman. And I think mm -hmm. there needs to be an option for that. And there needs to be people that you can speak to. Um, obviously, I have a very deep bond with women, and uh, you know, as men do with men, I think it's okay that mm -hmm. that is the case. Um, peer to peer mentoring is also really important. So then Jessica and I have gotten together at times, and I think that's really uh, important. I think it's very important that you see up and you see besides you, and you see, you know, uh, a, a lower down, you see all of that. You have a community yeah. of individuals that you can interact with. I hadn't thought about the sideways. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's not, I mean, you know, like obviously in a, maybe in a, in a club where you're trying to meet people, maybe the, you know, being, having a skewed uh, situation might be good. But when you're looking at your life, you want to have that kind of richness of experience um, where you can interact with other people. Did you want to you. say any more about, about mentoring, either doing it or receiving it? I mean, I think, um, I mean, there, the, you know, I've thought a fair amount about this um, in you know, mentoring students in my group. Um, and, you know, I should say that I don't think we can put the genders into different buckets because there's personalities as well, right? So across, across um, you know, both groups, there's sort of a spectrum of personalities. But I do find that um, with, uh, you know, oftentimes it is helpful to kind of work with, with uh, female students in my group and, and beyond to really help build up uh, sort of their confidence and sort of the yeah. way they're presenting their work. I do see that there, 
you know, maybe on average is a little bit of a difference in how uh, women and men present um, present their ideas and the confidence that they have in, in doing so. You know, you take the, it, so I think that there there is something there and, um, you know, some of the advice that I give to my students is to just, you know, focus on the content. That was always what helped me, is to just focus on the content. And, you know, I was always really interested in it, curious, and I think when you do that, it speaks to everybody in the room, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to hear from Pardis um, on this topic as well. Um, you know, and then also I think a few other pieces of advice, you know, not to be too polite. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you know, as women, we're sort of, we're brought up to be polite. That's not a bad thing, but you don't want to be too polite. You know, if you're interrupted in an exam, you know, you want to make sure you get back to your answer because you have to make sure that, you know, the professor knows that you know that answer, for example, you know. <laughs> and um, so, you know, mentoring them, mentoring them in that way, I think, is important. Um, and I think also, you know, it goes both ways. Having a diverse group, I think, is, is, um, is useful sort of in, from both sides, you know, di diversity of personalities, genders, you know, backgrounds, et cetera. Because, you know, they all, the students all pick up things from each other as well, oh, okay. and sort of best practices, and, and um, yeah. So t I'd love to follow up on this, the word confidence mm -hmm. that came up. And I, 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 to me, that's one of those key words that it's, it's fuzzy, but everybody, there's something there, there, when you're talking about women in science or mm -hmm. women, period. I, anyway, uh, parties do you want? Uh, I mean, there's that, and there's also the, the, the idea that the diversity of the group that's not just gender based is being important. I don't know, is that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can speak to all that. I mean, I'm, I, uh, I mean, I. I, 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 my, my mind's going in a lot of different directions, and I could talk about my group all day long. So I, I love my group, and I love, and so I have like a story about this and story about that. But I mean, the the big thing is that for every member of my group, man or woman, I I have a big line. I say that um, I want you all to be assertive. It's says very important to me that you're assertive. A lot of times I'm like, oh well, you know, I don't care about that authorship. I'm like, you do. Just say you do. Like it's okay to to. And so the idea is that I say. I want every member of my group to be assertive so that they're never aggressive. You see a lot of, there's an opposite thing that happens where a lot of women just take it, they kind of get beaten down a lot and they keep pretending like they don't need things that they need. And then later they kind of randomly grab out at something that they don't, you know, don't deserve or don't, because they don't know, they don't have an understanding of what do I need to be successful, how do I move through my career. So I really push my students a lot to develop confidence, to develop what I call their inner voice, um, to kind of understand what, and, it, and in that way, it makes you stronger in your science. Like you need, science is very difficult. There's a lot of failure, no matter what else is going on in your career. And so you have to have an inner strength and an inner voice, and you need environments that are going to uh, develop that. And that, there are other things with women that kind of make that difficult. They're not used to sort of standing out. Yeah, Sheryl Sandberg makes a very important point about that idea of being bossy and how that, that is a negative connotation. So women don't understand how to assert their voice without kind of going over the top and seeming the kind of uh, grading on people. And so I, I try to work with them to develop that, to really to do that in a smooth way. So I think that's a very important area. Another simple thing is just the timbre of a woman's voice. I went to this women's forum event um, in France where they brought in a, a speech therapist. And you know it's funny because they have all these like big sessions with Condoleezza Rice and all sorts of world leaders. And that was the most popular session, yeah. which is just get together and learn how to speak. and women also need to learn how to get that voice deeper. Just the simple logistics of being heard in a room is really important. And you have to actually do it. Like um, I have a lot of advice I give for women, but it's very important to do all those things so you don't end up becoming the woman that's bitter. That is the worst case scenario, right? Um, I, I tell women a lot of things that make it about how difficult it is. So I said, I kind of told you that I didn't have bad experiences to a point. Doesn't mean I haven't had a lot since. Um, and that, the way I say it is I don't, and I, and I tell a lot of stories to women that are frightening. And I say, I don't tell you these stories so you go around thinking that the world is unjust or that you'll never make it. I tell you so that you realize that, that it, there is a kind of, not a minefield, but a, a field you have to get through of complications. And I want you to recognize they exist so you avoid them, right? So you assert yourself to get through them. Is that just really important to understand what are true obstacles and what are not obstacles so that you don't go around kind of assuming 
you'll always get beaten down. Yeah. That is the worst case scenario. You know, Nancy Hopkins always said that uh, she felt that discrimination against women in science was very, very age related. That up to a certain point, up to a certain point, you're a young student, you're coming mm -hmm. along, this yeah. is fine, we, we love you. We get you this. Know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, yeah. you know, then you begin to compete in a way, or or just get older. I'm not sure whether she's just get in a space you're not used yeah, to being. Yeah, in. and become more, and, and so you both refer to kind of like up to a point. Mm -hmm. So, is the point related to age and experience? Is is that are you talking about a timeline of life, or, or, I, or do you I, think it's more a professional point? I, can I take that first? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> so I. I went through a really terrible experience that I don't necessarily want to get into, but I'll just kind of reflect on it. Um, what I say is, you know, um, maybe I'll, I'll refer to something kind of a popular, uh, so it's something that happened in the, in the popular uh, press or whatever, which is, just, I remember that election where both Hillary Clinton, um, and why am I actually? Barack Obama? No, 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 the woman. Uh, what, oh, oh. Sarah Palin. What's that? Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. There oh, we go. Wow. Uh, I feel about really it. <laughs> So yeah, but, yeah so both, both, both Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin were both going up for election. Couldn't ideologically be more different. But what I found was really interesting is the same people hated them and, and, and had the exact same ah, high-pitched scream as to how they described how they hated them. And, um, uh, and, then, and then you also see when women, something like a Martha Stewart situation, when something goes wrong and you get the same kind of reaction. And I said, you know, it took a long time for people to get that high-pitched scream when they talked about George Bush. But boy, can women, people, men and women, go crazy uh, at, at women who put themselves too far. And so, and, and I went through an experience where I was sort of down. I became a third-rate citizen for a little while, and I, and I saw the way everybody talked to me as, like, impertinent, reckless, careless. I mean, the way that they talked to me was just, and it started to use a lot of kind of gender-biased mm -hmm. words about not being good. And, and the way I say is the way you judge the moral grade of your society is not based on what happens when a person's walking down the street or in a coffee shop getting a coffee. It's what happens the minute that coffee gets dropped, right? Mm -hmm. And what they say, like, stupid, and all this mm -hmm. th things changes, mm -hmm. right? And so we stepped into a place where suddenly we were being observed. When you're a student, you're cute, you're a little bunny, nobody really bothers about you. But once you're in a space where judgment is possible, mm -hmm. Um, and judgment where people can have a snap reaction and not censor themselves, that's mm -hmm. when you see like the true situation. And mm -hmm. I think it's either when you get too high and then people start saying, well, that's, they're not worthy of that you know, yeah. high or low. It's like if you try to go fly too close to the sun or kind of get beaten, then all of that comes out. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start to see it. Mm -hmm. So that would be my sense. Is it's, yeah. not it's, not, it's not the age or anything like that. It's just what are you trying to do? And are you trying to step out of the bounds of what is normal and what we, can, we all have to kind of accept? I'm sure we'll have some questions on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so, so do you want to, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could add a little bit to that. I mean, I think that, you know, up to a point as a student, you're um, being evaluated in very clear terms, especially if you're taking courses where you're doing problem sets, you're, you know, turning in exams that are graded. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You either got that right or you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so that, <clears throat> that is very, you're, you're evaluated in these very objective terms. And then, you know, you get to a point where it's more about, you know, subjectivity. How good is that work? How are these Creativity people perceiving? Or, yeah. Well, how, you know, the perception, you know, and it's, we don't have clear metrics where, you know, you start to, to uh, notice these gender influences. Like, until that point, I didn't really notice it. But then it's like, oh, OK, you know, the how I'm speaking and the tone of my voice and, you know, what I'm wearing and all of that, you know, may, you know, it never even occurred to me that that was important. I mean, it occurred to me. But, you know, I never really f experienced that personally, you know, until this subjectivity comes in. And then you start to think, oh, OK, you know, that. You know, I, it's, it's just a realization that you are um, being perceived through the lens of gender to some extent. And, um, and then there's another thing at play, which is, you know, you kind of go through your career and you're, like Purdy said, you know, the cute little bunny. And then, you know, at some point, um, you're, you know, you're no longer pleasing, yeah. you know, working to please your professors and this and that. You know, you're, you're sort of 
you know, on, kind of emerging to, you know, where you're at the same level and you're, you know, you may disagree on certain points. And, you know, so I think negotiating that transition with, without going too far and becoming, you know, the most loudmouthed person in the room and, you know, also not being too timid, I think that sort of transition point is one that um, I certainly think it, it, it would be useful to offer mentorship yeah. to female, to, to women scientists yeah. and sort of making that transition. And that's So being prepared for it, not just mentally, but here are some things you can do to, to deal with the situation. Right, because I mean, oftentimes these are unconscious reactions yeah. that people are having and, and, and they're not, and, you know, there, there are situations where it's, it's really coming from a negative place, but there are other times where it's just... You know, it's 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 people are, are open-minded, um, and but you know, it's it, there are just certain things you can do to to make sure that you know um, you're being evaluated um, in you know uh, along the lines of, of what you want to be, and sort of your message is really mm -hmm. coming through. So. What do you wish you had known <laughs> um, 15 years ago? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, one example of something I wish I had known or took me a few years in my like time when I was at Oxford was, um, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, so you know, something that happened where it was like an understanding that came to me like midway through was actually uh, that the people were still, still sexist. It, then oh. it did take me a little while to figure that out. So. The, I often say that the one thing that was easier, and, and there's a lot of things that were harder, so it's just the one thing uh, that was easier about the time that we came in compared to the time that you came through, is it was very clear what was going on to you, right? I mean, women weren't even allowed in the school to begin with, right? So you understood that people just didn't expect women to do education and to do well, right? So like a, few, a generation before. And so when you came in, you recognized that there was like a very clear threat, right? Mm -hmm. That people did not expect you to achieve, did not expect you to go to one. But for us, like basically we hadn't experienced sexism uh, through our early time and we didn't think there was such a thing. So it took me about three years into my PhD experience to understand why I always felt that my ideas were not as good, why I always felt okay. that like I was just not good enough. Um, it really took a long time to articulate because everybody's happy, happy. We get very, very frustrated at rhetoric where people walk around and political correctness I think is a dangerous thing because I don't want to change behavior, I want to change feelings. And so everyone's walking around being like, oh no, it's nothing, and then there's a roll of the eyes and you're just like, what just happened? Um, and like every time you had an idea, it just wasn't quite good enough that then it same, suddenly comes from somebody else, it's much better. And I think that that actually took me a really long time. And then one day, I swear it was like a day when I suddenly realized every woman in this, you know, in this like uh, research center is depressed, right? Mm -hmm. and, and every woman in this research center thinks that they are no good as a scientist. I was like, I get it. Like, it's just an insidious thing. And it seeps into, and if people don't tell you, I mean, as soon as actually somebody said something to the fact of, like, you're a woman, you can't do better, it, like, was very motivating. I was like, oh, I get this. Yeah. Okay, now I'll prove you wrong. But when it happens in a way that it's not articulated, you actually internalize it and you think it's your problem. So again, I, and it's the same thing of why I tell women there is sexism is so that that never happens to them where they don't recognize that that might be what's going on. Yeah. But you don't want it to get to the sole point where you think everything that doesn't happen for you is because of that reason. So the more we can get like understanding of like what is the, this bias and then what is what we need to, you know, sometimes your idea is just bad and that also should be clear, but you should begin to understand which is which. And I think it, I wish I had recognized earlier on that this was just a thing, and then I had to have my own internal clock. I had to assert my inner voice. I had to assert myself and, and speak my inner voice. It would have saved me a couple of years of my life, I think. Well, but think of these women. You know, it wasn't until a lot of them were quite senior that they yeah. sat down in the room together and discovered they all had the same experience. So at least you're, That's right. you, you That's came right. to it a little earlier than they, than they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, what did you think? What do you wish you had known 15 years ago? Um, yeah, I mean, I think this understanding when I was going through this transition between, um, you know, just feeling supported by everybody. The, the bunny to the rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, let's call it that. To the, like, pest, right, <laughs> yeah. as a rodent or something. You know, sort of feeling supported by everyone, and then suddenly it's like, oh, you know, 
yeah. that person isn't, yeah. you know, responding to what I'm saying, and that, you know, person is shooting that down, and you know, and sometimes, as Pardis mentioned, it's just, you know, you say something, it's not a good idea, but, but you know, sometimes you say something, and it is a good idea, and I wish I had. Um, gotten to that realization mm -hmm. sooner because you know you do waste a little bit of time kind of internalizing this saying oh you know what's going what's on right? and and kind of learning also how to make that transition because I think there are ways um, and um, you know that's something that I do try to I mean I don't, I don't have sort of a ready-made list right now but I sort of try you know over time to reflect on that so I can share those insights with my yeah. students, um, you know, and, and kind of making that transition. And, and I think also having more senior women just present, as Pardis mentioned a while back, you know, just around. I think that's really important yeah. because, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's a real, yeah. it's a huge deal. Right. Um, I, I just have a, one more question before we open it up. And that's about Oxford. I mean, did you feel like it's the same there as here, or was it a very different milieu? In the, it, you know, for women in science, just positive yeah. or negative? I'm just curious how much travels across the Atlantic in terms of culture. Yeah. Um, well, Oxford's an interesting place, right? Because you, I mean, if you're one of in one of the older colleges, you go to <laughs> to have dinner, and there's high table, and it's you know literally a table up on a stage with. Um, right. You know, everyone's dressed in their subfusk, and uh, you know, up on the stage, it's primary. It's really only men. There may be like one woman, and then every now and then, you get invited as a grad student to sit at high table. You're the only woman, you know, in this sort of group. Of, and there are so many traditions, you know, around like retiring to the den after, you know, after dinner, and uh, passing around glasses of port, and you know, um, various other, you know. Like the know, rituals drinks and, and rituals and so <laughs> forth. So it's it is very those rituals are very male dominated, um, and uh, so in that sense it's it's different. Um, I mean it's different in a lot of ways. I had a I had a great um, men, you know a couple of mentors Christopher Viney and David Cockaine and you know and they were I don't know in my research I guess I. I I, it wasn't until a little bit later that I went through this sort of transition no, okay. to the rabbit, as we talked about. <laughs> but um, you know, I think, I think, um, yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's a very different environment. I, I, I don't know that it, it you know, these, these gender issues we're talking about would be better or worse there. It's, it's in general, I guess, you have a little less exposure to. You know, faculty, and I found. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. you found yeah. that. I mean, certainly, you have more exposure to people outside of your field through your college and graduate students from other fields and so forth. But in terms of, um, you know, the faculty at large, I think you have a bit less exposure. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it could be even more. You know, it could be quite isolating. Yeah. So if you did run into a problem, I would be really worried about you know sort of getting out of that. Yeah, I would actually say just I would speak. I think that it's hard to be a woman in any country in the world, but I do still think that the United States of America is the best place to be a woman. That a lot of other places are way further behind and the gender roles are way less defined. And, um, and having spent time internationally, I recognize that actually in America, it's not like they don't have the problems, but you can say something and somebody will be like, we'll pay attention. So it, that, that's basically the thing. I mean, there's, you know, we still have. Um, corruption of our senators, you know, and that's a problem. But if you're caught taking money, there's a repercussion, whereas in some places in Africa, there's no repercussion. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of context, the same thing of, you know, there is plenty of sexism in the United States as well, but if it happens and someone catches it, it's kind of, you know, it can be, if, they, if you can get attention for it, you can, people know it's, it's supposed to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think that even in Europe, those gender roles are that mm -hmm. defined, and I know a lot of women, um, that are very unhappy, uh, I think. Uh, particularly, like you said, women that are trying to be professional. I actually feel, I like, I actually had a wonderful time in Oxford and I have a wonderful mentor there and, and all of that, but I, I do think all of the female graduate students were depressed and felt bad about themselves and that's, that's not good. great. That's all good. the ones I knew. <laughs> we even had like, you know, we had all the, the Rhodes, uh, there's a Rhodes women like, knitting club that just sat around and talked about why they were depressed all the time. So um, there, were, there, was, there was issues. There were issues. And, and I think that they will also come forward, and it's getting better and better. But 
Um, but it's it, it's hard anywhere in the world to try to try to become a professional woman to be taken seriously in in a culture that just for so many years it's like you you said it's so embedded. Um, we're we're as a human community we're trying a very different experiment to have half of the population get into the workforce that wasn't there before, and a lot of people are slow to it, but. Um, I think America has moved the most quickly and responds the most to these kinds of things. Okay. All right. That, that is an encouraging note. So we have to turn yeah. to everybody else who's here who must have questions, comments. Yeah, just, but do, if you would stand in front of the mic just so we get a recording. Thank you. And would you introduce yourself? Sure. Just... My name is Esther Shilpratt. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I hate to be a note of discordance, but I will be one anyway, because I'm in computer science. And there's no women in that either. There remain no women in that. And I know at least two professors in this university who I would say were very sexist to me and impacted my career horribly. Mm -hmm. So and then when I went to the student person who's supposed to help you, she just said, well, you know, that money's gone. They spent it, you know, the money they owed me. I mean, that's an answer. So no, nobody cared. Nobody cared. And I did complain. And I think those guys are back in the 70s. What I would really like to see happen is that what goes on in industry needs to go on in university. Mm -hmm. In industry, they would haul everybody in. And all these places, like I know so-and-so made a big gaffe with his... Um, comment about women, it was at Google, or I forget already the company it was, Microsoft. but Microsoft. Microsoft. <laughs> made, you know, he made a big gaffe, but they still, Microsoft and all those other people, Oracle, Google, they haul everybody in and give them a talk about diversity. That doesn't happen here. Mm -hmm. So the gods who have their tenure and their chairs, they can go on, be whatever they want, and just say, oh my God, she's just no good. Mm -hmm. We really, in computer science, have a long way to go. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So, I, like I said, my own situation, I, like I said, I won't go into details, but I know exactly what you mean, and you feel like helpless, and no one's going to listen to you, and this is the way it's going to happen. I, in this situation, I had a mentor, a single mentor, who looked out for me, and that's the only reason I left standing, which is why I do think they're so important. But I, no, I agree. I'm not, I, I'm saying that I mean, probably it's a more of a general, in other places in the world, it's like, at least we can sit in the room and be horrified by your story. Like in some of these other countries, nobody would be horrified by that at all. They'd be like, oh, and what, what happened, right? So um, I, I do recognize and I do think academia in a lot of ways is the most backwards, absolutely. And it is because in, in general, it wasn't designed in, there was like a, there's no intelligent design, I would say, about how the academic structure was brought up and it is extraordinarily hierarchical. Um, and I do think the things like the, that gender report were really important because they actually shed light on, well, this is the issue. Um, and I think that for, uh, like you said, the transparency that you can get are gonna be critically important. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I could talk about very specifically about your issue, but I have heard that. I've become, a, after my own like terrible experiences, I've become a kind of unofficial ombudsperson for a lot of people who know that they need to talk to me about something going wrong. I'll get incensed for you and I'll try to figure out how to help you, and sometimes I can and sometimes we can only laugh about it, you know, and try to figure out how to get you out of a situation where you ever have to interact with those people again. Because the, often I also say this, I say there's no, there's truly, there are truly terrible people out there in the world, many of them, and I often tell you that they exist so that you can just avoid them. Um, and maybe, I'm not saying that we should all just keep avoiding this person, they should be taken to task. But for your own personal good, the best thing to do is kind of get out of that situation, get into a place where you can be uh, appreciated. You know, the t this it's making me think that the title of the session is, is not quite precise. Because it's women in science, we're talking about women in academic science. Mm -hmm. And, and I, mm -hmm. I know I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people who have gone into business, uh, you know, and either you know, racial minorities or women, and they're much happier. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole world out there beyond the university, <laughs> which is not nirvana, we know that too. But still, it is things are done differently, and, and it is an alternative. So, uh, more questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Eric Staten. I'm a graduate student in comparative media studies. Um, and you've both talked a little bit about issues that you've experienced that seem to be in the lab and in research groups. Um, one of the main complaints that I've heard from 
female faculty in the humanities, not specifically here, but in general, is about things like course load and teaching load and you know, having male faculty um, who actually get more you know, time off to go write their books and you know, continue their careers where you know, they find as women they end up teaching you know, more classes than seems like they ought to be. Um, and I'm wondering if that's also something that's happening in the sciences, if that's something that you've experienced. I know the, like, the credentialing mechanisms are different, so books versus articles. I don't know if that actually mm -hmm. has an effect on the time that you get to sort of do your own work and how those effects play out in your experience. Mm -hmm. But I was just curious if you had you know, something to share about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, so before I took this faculty position, I actually had a number of um, senior colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute that just told me, like, time and again, like, just say no to stuff. Don't say, you know, I think to the point. So when I came here, I actually did say no to a lot of things and probably, you know, upset some people. But, um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, and I think MIT is pretty good about looking out for junior faculty in that, in that way. Um, but I think what you're talking about, I mean, I can totally, I, I totally think that that's happening on many campuses, and, and probably here as well, you know. Um, there is this, um, you know, there was an article in the New York Times um, a while back, this is a slightly different issue, but it was something like, Madam CEO, get, can you get me a coffee? Something mm -hmm. along those lines. You know, there is a little bit of that. You know, so it's like it's a little different from what you're talking about, but I think it's related. Where, you know, I think as a woman, sometimes you get asked to do things, and it's not just getting a cup of coffee because now we we kind of know, okay, that's off limits. We can't do that. But it's like, you know, what are you asked to do? Like versus, you know, a male colleague where that maybe they'd go to your assistant first before going to you to ask for that particular thing. So I think there are, these things are real and, and, and they do happen. I think to the extent um, we can collect data on, um, on you know, teaching load and so forth. I guess there was a Yale report in 2012 that focused on um, salary uh, among uh, women faculty as compared to male faculty and found this like, you know, the significant, um, significantly lower salaries for female faculty. But I think, you know, as universities, we should be able to, we should keep track of what people are doing and review that and just make that part of, you know, the end of year review process for the department. Look at, you know, who's doing what and, and you know, who's car is anybody carrying too much of the load? You know, Eric, after the, the uh, report that Pardis was describing about women in science at MIT, um, the provost ordered all the other schools, all the other four schools, to do a similar report to study just this kind of thing. I mean, space was less an issue in a non-lab environment, but teaching low time off salaries and so forth. So each school did, you know, did a data analysis and where there were problems, again, and the idea was if you have the numbers, then you can correct them. You know, it, though, in, it, it's interesting that we've had this conversation for you know an hour, and we haven't mentioned uh, motherhood uh, and family time, and and that actually is where women often feel like I've had a baby, I have small children, you know, wh where's mm -hmm. how how does that fit in, especially in a day and age where fathers are doing a lot of uh, work too um, with children. So uh, you know, again, one of the results of the women in science study was to look at family leave policy. And, and essentially to change it at MIT so that if a woman bears a child during the pre-tenure period, the tenure clock is extended by a year. Just And don't ask for it. it you get it. And it was very important not to be an option, but to be a requirement um, you, you know, for obvious reasons. So, so that is another area where you know, the, you know, when you have a family, when you have babies, then uh, all these questions come up yet again about mm -hmm. what's fair, uh, what's egalitarian. Yeah, and I think one of the nice things about MIT's policy is that um, fathers also get, yeah. you know, yeah. get that yeah, that I, I leave. But I guess there, you know, and I don't know if this is true. There's the stories that you hear that you know there were cases where uh, fathers were taking the leave, but they weren't the primary caregivers, <laughs> exactly. and so yeah. they were using that time to get tons of work done. Meanwhile, someone else is taking care of the kid. Um, so I think yeah. MIT has changed that now. So you have to show that you're the primary that caregiver. Not, yeah. Yeah. Um, no free 
three writers here. So that, yeah, but uh, but but yeah. I mean, this is I mean, it's just we're laughing because all these things, you know, they're bureaucratic. You want to regularize them. You really depend on the institution to have rules. But people are people. You know, yeah. everybody's different. Kids are kids, and uh, and it's, it's, it's hard. Not, it's it's hard. actually not a laughing matter. But yeah. it's sort of you can laugh or cry. You know, so <laughs> you might as well laugh. Um, did you have another? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Ah, please. Yeah, um, I was actually just going to do you want to introduce, introduce myself. Yourself. Yeah. I'm Anna Novogradsky. I'm a master's candidate in the MIT science writing program, and I worked in labs for eight years before coming here um, in plant biology mostly. So I was actually just going to mention that it's interesting that you. Um, said that the U.S. is one of the best places for women today when the U.S. is one of the only, only a tiny mm. handful of countries in the world that doesn't have any mandatory paid maternity leave um, and no, parent, no mandatory paid parental leave at all. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, I like to think about s large structural things that we can do that will help women, and I think that paid parental leave is the, the biggest one I can think of. I'm, First of all, very interested in you if you have ideas of other large structural changes we can make rather than just relying on individual women to, you know, stand up for themselves, which of course is also necessary. But um, and second, I'm wondering if you have any ideas because I'm ever hopeful of how we can actually get pa mandatory paid parental leave in the U.S. <laughs> um, so that that is that's a big one, and you're you're right about that. I mean, and I don't. I could be wrong, right? I mean, it might be that Germany is actually the best place to be a woman, and I, and I missed it. So yeah, so, yeah maybe, okay. so it, that, that, that's probably, um, uh, there's just a lot of cultures that are not great that I have seen. Um, but I would say, so it, I came back very happy to be in the United States and to, be, to make a career here. And again, and like you said, there are many structural major problems, but at least you can spar about it. There's one funny thing in England, the, just American women might be the most, oh, yeah. they must, might be the most hated, right? There, something about us are just, I mean, literally every single person in Oxford kind of hated me there in the academic system. And I think it's because we, they all probably look at us and say impertinent. It's just kind of across the board. So you can't really show, you can't have like gumption and show, like it's just not proper or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So, so it may also be a, being an American woman in, the, in that kind of European context. I, maybe I'm just not, also not handling it the right way, right? So I just like that we can, yell about it and say the CS professor is terrible. Like, we can, we can say those things and we actually have enough energy to say them. Where, whether we get anywhere is often not the case, but we can at least talk about it. But you speak to action, and I think that that is actually a very important thing. So I don't, so I don't have a child. That's a, it's part, of, part of the issue of women in science. Neither do I. I hope to uh, one day, whether mine or adopted, or, or, or I had a pet rat that I swear was my child. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I love things, and I, I like to nurture something. Um, but uh, so I haven't thought about that specifically, and I do think that that obviously is a major issue. Um, and so, and I'll, I'll let others speak to that if they're going to. Um, but as far as other ideas that I have for um, structural changes, I think the biggest thing is that idea of metrics and accountability and transparency. And the places where you see like this idea, this a academic environment in which like a cra crazy things happen, I think we need. A real good structure, and it and it shouldn't be. I think, I think I'll just talk about the academic stance. The academic, the problem with academia is the whole structure is not designed in a way that is was in, in all like intelligently designed. The fact of the matter is, you have these students. They do undergraduate in science. They do graduate school in science. They do a postdoc in science, and suddenly they're a manager, which doesn't make any sense. Many of them may be like mildly on the Asperger spectrum. Many of them just may not be nice people, but they're just good at what they do, and suddenly they are caring for the lives of people underneath them. Right? So that's already a problem. And, and to their credit, they've also got no training, no incentives, and no kind of thing in order to become better people. So that's kind of a broken system to begin with. And then if they get really good at what they do, somehow they become the chair, and then they kind of can move this through. We haven't, we, it's the same thing. I mean, we've got bigger problems. Why is it that our president is someone we should have a beer with, and why isn't it not somebody who runs a really good organization? I mean, we make silly choices about who to put in charge of certain things. And I think that overall, the, if the entire system was overhauled, where we did actually say that you know, these people, that, that people get training, that people get it, that you create a culture in which there's this transparency and open sea and, and mentorship to do the job you are doing, we would be better off. Um, you know, 
and, and then as that system kind of progresses. So in my mind, the, there's a much bigger problem, which is the culture of academic science is a little bit broken. I mean, graduate, lots of graduate students are d depressed, and lots of them are under mentors who abuse them or take away credit on their papers or, you know I mean, or, don't, or just are neglectful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a bigger thing. I think sometimes if you solve the systemic problems for all people, you'll help women a lot too. And women have an own specific set of issues because there's also this sexism that goes with it. But that problem that you describe happens to plenty of men as well. It's somebody who, for whatever reason, doesn't like the cut of your jib and is going to make you feel bad about yourself or just doesn't you know, have their head in the right place. So I think that that is a bigger thing. I mean, another specific thing, sorry, I can keep going. Things like ad boards or misconduct investigations, that's another place where there's a black hole that people go into. Is like an, and I've seen this with a lot of students where, again, and, and, I was, and you're reading a lot about the sort of sexual harassment on, on college campuses problem where it goes all wrong. Why are your professors running a legal case when they have no capacity? Why do we put people on committees that they have no competency for? I mean, and mm -hmm. one place where women get overloaded is in committees because you always need a woman on a committee. But like also on those committees, those committees are just poorly structured. And uh, if you, one more thing, if you look at the CV of a professor, their CVs do not make sense. They're on like 14 companies, they run a research lab, they teach five classes, they're on 25 committees. I mean, we're all exhausted because our CVs don't make sense <laughs> and don't fit into the day of one person, let alone six people. Well, those people are on committees that run these kinds of things like thinking about quality of life. They have no quality of life themselves. What are they doing thinking about quality of life? We need to empower administrators who are extraordinary, who are altruistic enablers, who make sure good things happen, instead of putting one more famous person on a committee to think about the quality of life, right? Um, so that's a structural problem that we need to think about. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing to that. Um, I mean, forums like this, you know, having talks, as, as was mentioned by one of the earlier um, uh, participants who asked a question, um, you know, talking about some of these issues, whether it's, you know, the get me a coffee syndrome or, um, you know, kind of transitioning from student to peer, how to navigate that, um, you know, what, what your supervisor should be, at, like, what's reasonable for your supervisor to ask you to do? I mean, to Pardis's point, as when I was a grad student, I remember thinking, I mean, I, I really enjoyed my um, PhD advisors, but just kind of looking around, I remember thinking, you know, when you're a grad student, your advisor is one of the most important people in your, in your life, uh, maybe the most important person. And I never want to forget that when I'm an advisor, because you have the power to make somebody's life miserable or you know, much more enjoyable. And you're also really um, influencing what you know, they can then do beyond grad school. So I think really, and that's, that's not just an issue for that women. That actually got me right here. Oh. <laughs> I'm like thinking about my grad students. I'm like, am I taking care of them? That's actually, it's true. It's true. It's a big responsibility. And, um, you know, it's not just, you know, as, as Pradeesh mentioned, I think that's more of a, you know, for, for everybody, the whole system. I think those are conversations we need to be having. And I think sometimes just having a conversation about these issues, you know, articles in, in the press and conversations like this, it just, you know, then when you see it happen, you think, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't be asking that person to get me a coffee or, you know, whatever it is you're, you know, and, and, and so I think that's a really important um, sort of action that universities can take. Any more, any more questions? Tom. I have one, or sort of, these are, these are really uh, two, uh, two issues I have that I simply, they're not really questions, but I'd like your reaction to them. Oh, comments. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, there's been a lot of both, you know, public media coverage and, and some research studies on the problem of unconscious bias. You know, the study at Yale where they sent out resu identical resumes with male and female and URM typical uh, names and got the results that we all know about. The, uh, the article in the New York Times by a wonderful creative writing professor at Michigan who started in life as, I think, the first undergraduate to get a BA in physics, undergraduate woman to get a BA in physics at Yale. And the, the bias that persists in the Yale physics department unnoticed even by the then female head of that department, these <laughs> kinds of things. So the um, problem, of course, with unconscious bias is it's unconscious, which makes it you know, difficult to fix. 
Um, and I'm wondering if you have particular strategies and or thoughts for rendering the unconscious conscious and therefore addressable by, by explicit reaction, explicit action. And in my mind, and maybe only there, the sort of next thing that I've been thinking about is connected to that, which is uh, there's an enormous amount of writing now and, and incredibly depressed graduate student and postdoc blogs um, about the academic bottleneck, the fact that we are drastically overproducing, quote unquote, um, graduate students in the sciences as, as, you know, people in the humanities are used to this, you know, horrible overproduction of, of PhDs for whom there are no jobs and it's now being explicitly discussed in the sciences even though it's been a problem for a lot longer there. Um, and that creates uh, stresses that, that often play out in, uh, in gender and race, in, in gender and race identifiable ways. Uh, and I wonder if, again, if you've sort of, as, as heads of labs, et cetera, have addressed that in your own thinking. Uh, yeah, I, well, I could start. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think this unconscious bias um, uh, question is an important one. And I think one of the ways it manifests itself is actually in women's self-perception, the perception of themselves, um, and their level of confidence, right? And that was, I mean, that's something that a number of people writing on the topic have highlighted. And, and I think it, it rings true. Um, you know, because as, uh, you know, as was mentioned, I think if you're sort of getting a reaction from the outside world and it's, it's not really explicit, it's not talked about, then you might internalize it and that can lead to, you know, less confidence in, in how you're presenting your ideas and so forth. So I think that's something that the more it's, it's talked about, I think the better and, and we can recognize it in ourselves and our students, support you know, our students. And it's, it's something that you can, you can work through. I think, again, you know, what I tell my students is really focus on the content, focus on what you're most interested in. What do you want? Don't, don't worry about what people are thinking of you. What do you want them to know? Like, what, what are you most interested in? And kind of that's as a, you know, way to deal with some of these questions around, you know, that people have talked about the imposter syndrome and, you know, am I really worthy of this position? Should I, do I deserve to be here? Um, so I think that's important. And then I think the other thing that um, I, I guess touches on, on um, what you mentioned is this idea that, uh, and this actually I think came up in the New York Times article you were, were, were referring to where uh, this Yale professor was talking about um, you know, kind of going through school and, and not doing so well in exam, physics exams and so forth and you know, eventually succeeding. Um, um, as a professor, and I think you know that's something I can I can relate to is this idea. It, you know, she attributed that to kind of trying to think about the problems that she was being given in the way that her her male colleagues were thinking about them. When she kind of let go of that and tr and decided to start solving the problems using her own method and her own thinking, then suddenly it all made sense and she really progressed. And that's something I can relate to personally. I think there were times, you know, kind of growing up where I thought, oh, I'm not, you know, thinking about things in the right way. You know, I had this one math class. I came home and my, you know, I told my mom I can't do it, and she was like, what? What are you talking about? You can do it, you know. And so we went in. We met with the professor, and then it became or with the teacher, you know, and it became clear afterwards that the problem was that I was, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about things in my way. I was thinking about things the way the teacher was, you know, describing them, and that, it, you know, that didn't make sense to me. So I thought, well, I have to think about things like that, but, you know, it, it wasn't the case. So when I sort of started to think about things in my own way, then it all made sense, and, and I uh, was able to progress. So I think that's... Um, you know, something that, again, if we can highlight that, then more, uh, you know, women and, you know, students in general, I think, will, will sort of feel more comfortable taking their own paths and sort of building up their own confidence. Um, and I think, by the way, and that's a kind of getting off topic, but this, this idea of really, um, you know, this idea of, of people thinking in different ways is one of the reasons why you see increased performance in diverse research groups. And that's something I've observed firsthand in my own group. So. Okay, and then we'll be, st I'll, I'll do the, question. I'll go to the first yeah. and the second, then you okay. can do the second. After. All right. Okay. So um, for the first question about unconscious bias, <clears throat> I mean, I adore Mazarine Banerjee. I just think she's the coolest. Um, she's actually my, was my mentor for a little while. And 
And, and it's what's, what's awesome about her is not only is she just uh, brilliant and, uh, and insightful, but you know, she, she's very open. I mean, she, and she had said often that she, when she took the test herself, she, she kind of was failed and was like sort of shocked by that. And I think that the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of people, I mean, everyone has unconscious bias. Women are obviously very subject to that. And often you see that women are women on women kind of uh, sexism is really problematic. Um, and, we, and we see that all the time, too. But, um, but even in that, in the case of Mazarin, I know that it's just well-meaning people who have, have ever kind of caught off guard to realize that they were participating. This would be horrified, um, but don't realize these things have kind of gotten into their unconscious. And, um, and I think that that speaks to the point that Jessica made earlier about the more we make this transparent, the more we move the needle forward, because the more people can catch themselves. Like, do you realize like, what you're doing, or do you realize how that sounds, or just checking people? And it also just makes a difference about, um, the thing is, it's, it's like basically there's a lag that happens. We are moving forward. We have moved forward. It isn't that we haven't. It just takes a while. And, and then unconscious is the thing that takes the longest to kind of clear up, right? But if we behave well, our children will see something different. And then maybe they will then just be different, where we're not quite all, all there yet. So I'm hoping that it's a couple of generations will move forward a little bit. Um, but I remember when I, when I started having like, the most trouble, where I was really, I, I, it was like I said, late in my career, probably my 30s, where I was like, the world is not just, and things are bad, and I started to recognize all these things. And, and there was a part of me that became a little bit of like a radical, and I wanted to go out and just do this. I wanted to write a book about you know, all the problems that happen, and it's something I really wanted to do. And in the end, I realized that actually, if I do that, then, uh, then I haven't really made a difference, because I'm yet another woman who dropped out of a scientific track to go do something that wasn't scientific. And so ultimately, you know, I, I ended up staying with it and I, and I decided to be just the change yourself, right? And that fundamentally, if we just stick with it and we show, then the community changes and the culture changes and there's more women at the high levels. And naturally, even if we don't become advocates, it just is different because we think differently. I mean, my lab, I take them all to Florida every year and we do a ridiculous retreat. We have holiday cards. We create a different environment that, you know, it's a clown show in some ways, but it's an environment that probably, you know, uh, would not have happened, you know, in the 70s. I don't, you know, think that my professors at Oxford were saying, like, everybody, we're going to, you know, Typhoon Lagoon. Um, but I, you know, I, I just think differently, and if more women go to the top than everybody, you know, than the cultures around you think differently. Um, to, to the second question that you have about the graduate student situation, I think the graduate students have a lot of, there's, it's a hard thing being a graduate student. Worrying about your long-term trajectory, in my mind, is the least of it, right? The worst of it is just, is this environment nurturing and, cult and um, nurturing for you to really do something exceptional in science and to innovate something new um, and to not get lost on the path going through this ambiguity, right? There is, I, I mean, I'm very kind of watching for my graduate students to achieve this thing, which is an extraordinary complicated thing, which is taking something that's very all over the place and then creating a unit of information into the world. That training to me, when you do that thing, when you actually take all of this noise and turn it into a beautiful signal or all this chaos and create something that's a book, is an exceptional piece of training I wish everybody had. I wish my president had. I wish my you know, senators had. I wish people in industry had. I think that a PhD is an amazing degree to have. I, I had an MD, I had a PhD, and I'd say, yeah, the MD feels like more work, and obviously that track and the grades you have to get are really hard, but it's very prescriptive. You just come to school and you do the assignment and you get through, whereas a PhD is you, are, you, you have to take an ownership to it. So I think it's an exceptional training, and I think we should just think differently about that problem. It's not like, oh, but why are we getting all these PhDs if there's no professorships? Professorship's not that great of a gig. I've done it, and I, frankly, you may see me in industry soon. And I think that we should just encourage more of our PhDs to take that training and build companies and go into uh, policy and transform things. I wish more, you know, more people had PhDs and that we took that and used that to change the world. Okay, and and I will just say yeah. for the undergraduates here, there's also a senior thesis or any piece of work where mm -hmm. you get it together. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. that's. That's great. Yeah, and I mean, I was actually, that was exactly my answer to your second question. Um, I mean, just, just to add a slight bit to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, given the problems that governments face, industry faces, having that, the ability to um, think analytically, to um, create signal from noise, kind of 
to research something, you know, look into a problem in depth and come up with your own conclusions, I think is useful beyond the university. And I don't know how to get that message out there. Maybe it's something between, you know, maybe it's, it's both recognizing ourselves what, what the PhD is giving students, you know, and sort of what general skills um, that sort of gives them to be leaders in industry, in government, in academia, sort of making that more explicit. Um, or maybe it's, it's, you know, kind of um, more outreach, um, you know, working more closely with government and industry at earlier stages, introducing our students to, you know, I think there are lots of ways we could move that situation forward. I, I think I, I will try to wrap this up by just saying that both of you are in areas of science where you really are trying to address big problems of the world, the biggest. And, and it really helps to relate women in science to that goal. And, and if nothing else, I think talking about women in science reminds us what the big goals should be, why, why we're all in this business to start with. And the, the system is broken in many ways as the parent of a postdoc for men or women, it's, it's, there's a lot that needs to be better mm -hmm. because those big problems are there. And we need a system that really encourages people to address them and not get so depressed along the way or, or drop out. Mm -hmm. So as so often the case, if you think about making the system better for everybody, then women will benefit too, but uh, not only. Thank you for coming. I really, I really yeah, appreciate you. your time, and, and especially our panelists' time. Let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you.